Hey, this is Warren Redlick. I am here with Jordan Giesecke, who has my favorite channel on YouTube, The Limiting Factor. He has a Patreon. I have a Patreon. I am only a Patreon supporter of one channel on Patreon, and it is The Limiting Factor. Huge fan of his channel. Before we get started, I just want to encourage you to check out his Patreon. There's a link in the description below. Um, one of the things about the way YouTube works is a lot of us are driven to produce our videos in a way to attract more viewers, to get more viewing time so we can make more money from YouTube. And Jordan often talks about how by getting support from Patreon, he's able to focus on just making quality videos in depth rather than trying to obsess about chasing the algorithm. And um, I have a different approach, which is I'm just not that worried about the money, but I do try to make something out of it. And I do chase the algorithms a little bit. And, you know, honestly, I think, Jordan, you have the best. I genuinely believe this. You have the best channel on YouTube. I watch every video. I love it. Your production quality is great and your insight is great. So thank you so much for coming on my channel. Yeah, well, I appreciate you having me. And I, I enjoy your channel as well. Um, I was uh, there's an interview that you did the other day with uh, Bradford Ferguson. And just the, the breadth and depth that uh, you get into is uh, really useful to the Tesla community. So I, I really enjoyed Thanks. that interview. You know, and hopefully we can go into depth on a topic. The reason I asked Jordan to come on is because I'm obsessed with Tesla's batteries and Jordan covers Tesla's battery technology better than anyone else. And there's this thought that's been chewing at me for a while about something that makes Tesla special. So Jordan, my pitch, and we talked about this before we started, but Jordan, my pitch is one of Tesla's key advantages that no one seems to talk about is Tesla's ability to flex it's flexibility to be able to choose between different batteries for different architectures. Tesla can use lithium, Tesla uses lithium iron phosphate from CATL, lithium iron phosphate, I think from SK Innovations, maybe from Samsung, they get some batteries from them. They get 2170s from LG Chem and Panasonic. They get 1865 cells, which go uh, for, from Panasonic. They're producing their own 4680 cells. I think they may be getting lithium iron phosphate cells from BYD Blade. And you can see the flexibility in an architecture like the Model Y, which can use a lithium iron phosphate battery pack from CATL. It might be able to use a BYD Blade battery pack. It can use uh, 2170 cells from Panasonic or LG Chem, and it can use 4680 cells from Tesla and eventually from Panasonic and LG Chem as well. And no, every other company, as far as I know, has one or two battery formats. Do you have any thoughts on that? The, the, for the big picture topic, do you have any thoughts on that, Jordan? Yeah, this is actually something I've been thinking about quite a bit lately. Uh, in the past, for the past couple of years, I've been referring to it as battery Tetris. Can, uh, Tesla doesn't really have any competitors in the battery space. They'll take advantage of anybody who can supply them with battery cells. And because they have, their vehicles are the lowest cost, they can basically take straw and weave it into the gold, it, weave it into gold. They can take battery cells from anybody and uh, uh, turn a profit on them. So I think for, if you're a smaller company, if you're just getting into the EV game, I think if you just stick with one battery chemistry, you're fine, but I don't think you can survive and hit super massive scale unless you can adapt your vehicles to multiple different battery chemistries. Because there's so many different battery cell manufacturers, if you want to get the most out of the supply chain out of and take advantage of multiple supply chains at once, you need to be able to adapt. For example, like if you're, and these are really back, back of the napkin numbers, uh, say you have a, the average gigafactory is something like 20 gigawatt hours. And let's say you can get like 200,000 vehicles out of that. I know that's not 100% accurate, but it gives us a, that's about right. a, a sense of scale. 200,000 vehicles, that's enough for like a Ford or a GM for a new product ramp. But Tesla's going to hit, hit uh, a 2 million vehicle run rate by the end of the year. So that's 10 factories like that. So right. yeah, uh, all that drives towards the point of, I don't think you can hit massive scale without being able to use multiple chemistries. Right. I mean, what I noticed is as far as I know, GM is using the so-called Ultium as their at least battery of the future. I don't know if they have it now. I don't know of any... I think Volkswagen uses at least two different types of batteries. They, they sort of set this goal that they've got their battery factories that they're starting to build in Europe. And that's one type of battery. But Porsche, I believe, might use a different cell. But even Volkswagen, which is probably the largest legacy automaker for making EVs, they're pretty much dependent on one format as far as I know. Yeah. And there's, 
if Tesla could, I think Tesla would use one form factor or a couple form factors because it's more efficient. You don't have to dick around with uh, swapping out battery packs on the lines and uh, adapting uh, to whatever's available in the supply chain. But that's not the reality of what we're dealing with right now. So you have to you have to be able to use multiple chemistries. What I've noticed, there's this particular moment that happened, I want to say in the last month or two, that Tesla's mega pack page, for those who don't know, Tesla makes a dev, uh, grid store, makes battery storage devices, power wall for the home and mega pack for grid storage. There's also a power pack in there somewhere. I'm not sure what happened to power pack, but mega pack was using, as far as I know, 2170 and 1865 nickel based cells from Panasonic and Giga, Tech, Giga Nevada. And they've shifted to lithium iron phosphate and it's now I believe more expensive and it has more megawatt hours. Now, I think it's gone from three megawatt hours to four megawatt hours. And my one of my theories is that they were delivering about four gigawatt hours of mega packs a year before this change. And they're gonna be scaling up to 40 gigawatt hours from or more from the new factory in Lathrop. But by shifting to lithium iron phosphate, it frees up the cells they were using, the nickel-based cells, the 1865s and 2170s, that they were using for mega pack and they can now use those in model Y, model three or model S and X. The 2170s can use, be used in model three and model Y and the 1865s can be used in model S and X. Um, does that, do you think that's what, the, what they're doing? That by sh making this shift, they're freeing up cells? And, and sorry to be clear, four gigawatt hours by my numbers is 50,000 model Ys. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, this is something I've been, uh guessing that they might do for a while because Tesla prioritizes their vehicles and then any overflow kind of goes to energy storage. And Yvonne of the EV stock channel, uh, he did like a four or five minute video on this about two weeks ago. He's basically saying the same thing that you're pointing out. The Tesla, it, it looks like, especially since they had the shutdown in China, they might have this glut of battery cells that they're sitting on. And we know that they have a glut of battery cells that they're sitting on. It's just a matter of because they said that in a previous earnings call, they said, all right, we have kind of a stockpile of battery cells. It just comes down to a question of, all right, how many of that, how much of that glut are they going to reserve for vehicles and how much is going to go to the energy storage? Now, an interesting point that Yvonne brought up and what, what came up in the earnings call is uh, part of the reason why they weren't growing the energy storage business was also due to chips. Now, that bottleneck is supposed to be breaking right about now, according to Elon's past advice. So you have this glut of battery cells, and on top of that, you have the chips. Making energy storage battery packs are, is a lot easier than vehicles making vehicles. So as I said earlier this year, it should be able to grow like kelp on steroids and uh, double, triple, quadruple their annual output within a short period of time. So well, that's actually Zach Kirkhorn. There was, I, I tweeted this earlier today that in the Q, I think it was the Q1 earnings call, I tweeted a, a, a bit from the earnings transcript. Drew Baglino, Elon, and Zach were talking about Megapack, and they used that kind of language, double, triple, quadruple, 200, 300% growth this year. They were aiming to grow Megapack this year. And, and Drew had talked in the past about a flotilla of batteries coming from China, I think returning, referring to LFP from CATL. Tesla doesn't use lithium iron phosphate much in their vehicles in the US. I think maybe the standard range Model 3 may be using lithium iron phosphate cells. But by and large, they use nickel-based cells for vehicles in the U.S. because the U.S. customers want more range. Although the standard range Model 3 is actually not bad in LFP when you charge it to 100%. So I just see this, this window of if they have extra cells for 2170, then they can divert those for, and they can divert those from Megapack into Model Y. One of my theories is maybe they, I haven't seen a lot of news about the 4680 Model Y recently. And I'm wondering, and when I was in, you were at Cyber Rodeo, but you were not at Cyber Roundup? Uh, the Cy Cyber Roundup, so I was- uh, You were not at the annual meeting? No, no, I wasn't at the annual meeting. So when you and I were at Cyber uh, Rodeo, Jordan and I walked around some of the Gigafactory together. They showed us an area where they were making 4680 Model Ys, or at least they were going to be making 4680 Model Ys. And they had this whole display about how the battery cells were going to drop down from this spot up above, or the battery packs were going to drop down from this spot spot up above, and they're going to put front and rear castings together with the battery pack. That area, when I was there for the annual shareholders meeting, they gave us another tour. That area was making 2170 model wise. I could see 
there was a uh, a vehicle that was put together that didn't have a battery pack on it. And you know, they couldn't assemble a vehicle without a battery pack if it was a 4680. And I asked our tour guide and she said, yes, that's a 2170 Model Y. So I concocted this theory in my head that maybe they stopped making 4680 Model Ys. And, you know, Elon announced that they're bringing Tesla Semi forward to this year from last year and Tesla Semi needs 4680s. So my thesis is, maybe they either stopped or they greatly reduced their production of 4680 Model Ys so that they could divert 4680s to semi, which semi needs 10 times as many cells per vehicle compared to Model Y, something like that. Does that make sense to you? What are your thoughts on that? Oh yeah, absolutely. It makes perfect sense to me. And this is something, as I was saying earlier, if you can, it's better to use one cell form factor so you don't have to mess around with uh, swapping out different packs. So it would streamline their current model Y line. If they had plenty of 2170s, why use two different battery packs if you can just use one battery pack and uh, you know fulfill demand that way and take those 4680s, set them aside for either a rainy day or start using them in the semi. So it yeah. makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. And, and the thinking I had was when we saw the 4680 Model Y coming out of Giga Texas and they were testing it, it had significantly less range than a long range Model Y with 2170s. And it didn't cost much less. They were charging maybe $3,000 less. So it just made me wonder if they, and, and also in one of the earnings calls, I think it was the Q2 earnings call, they sort of talked about how they know it's the right architecture now, but maybe they don't have the right they haven't optimized the architecture yet. They haven't optimized the cells yet, and they haven't optimized the structural pack yet. I actually wanted to ask you about this because you've done at least a couple of videos on a teardown of the 4680 cell. Mm -hmm. And I think you've seen some of the stuff that Monroe Associates have done. Monroe and Associates have done with 4680. Do you have a sense now of what the energy density is of the 4680 cell? In terms of the cell itself, well, here, here's where it's getting tricky because typically you, you can divide up you know, the energy density of a battery pack and battery cell. You can look at it at the cell level, you can look at it at the pack level, and then how it affects the vehicle. But what Tesla's done is they've made the cell part of the structure of the pack and they made the pack part of the structure of the vehicle. So all these lines are blurred now and it's hard to get uh, an accurate view of how much energy density these battery cells have. Now, there's I've seen a couple of estimates based on the data I provided from that 4680 teardown. And it's ranged from 250 watt hours per kilogram up to 300 watt hours per kilogram. As a uh, Troy at Tesla on Twitter, uh, he does a lot of financial analysis on, uh, uh, on Tesla. And he received a rumor that said it's, it's probably about 276 watt hours per kilogram. Now, that falls right in line with uh, some of the information that I got from UC San Diego. I've also ordered a cell from Monroe and Associates. Now, that yeah. one, I'm actually going to be able to cycle it because it's, it's a production battery cell and it was in good shape. The reason why I didn't cycle the, uh, the cell that I got out of the factory is because it was damaged and because it actually hadn't been through formation, formation yet. It wasn't a completed battery cell. So all the calculations we did were... Um, uh, manual calculations rather than actual measured. So I'm assuming, assuming it's between, you know, 250 to 275 watt hours per kilogram. However, with that battery cell, it also has a shell that's 20% of the weight of the battery cell. And normally it'd be maybe 5% uh, of the weight of the battery cell, maybe 10% of the weight of the battery cell. So that battery cell is carrying uh, like at least a 10% energy density penalty. So um, I would say that battery cell is on par with the best that the industry produces today. But that, 200, in the, yeah, that 276 watt hours per kilogram, I believe the 20, current 2170 model, uh, 2170 battery cell and the 1865s are also around 260 or 270 watt hours per kilogram, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, the Panasonic, is pretty innovative and they keep innovating on that architecture. So they're improving the, the quality of their cells. Oh yeah. And this is, oh, that's a whole nother discussion. We could go for an hour on that, but uh, just one final Not note. today. 
it, even if it is just 250 watt hours per kilogram, that 10% penalty means that if it didn't have that thick shell, it would actually be at a 276 or 275 watt hour per kilogram cell. So I'm not concerned about the energy density. My, my main interest in, is, uh, you know, what the pack level energy density is, and then how that pack level energy density affects the vehicle, because the pack is now part of the vehicle. So overall, right. how has it changed the weight of the vehicle in total? Now, at the moment, as Elon said, uh, the battery pack isn't optimized yet. And uh, they're still optimizing the entire Model Y architecture. So I don't think we're going to see as big as an impact as everybody expected with this generation of a Model Y. Now, going forward, I do expect that structural pack and uh, the improvements they're making to the Giga castings and uh, the architecture of the Model Y itself to eventually drive down to what they suggested on battery day. But that's understandable because they said it was they were looking at about a three year horizon and it's only been two years. Yeah, well, the thing with the the the, the 4680 Model Y that we did see coming out of Austin was it didn't weigh much less than a long range Model Y with 2170s. And my expectation was, hey, you've got a 10 or 15 less kilo, you got 10 or 15 less kilowatt hours in the pack. When you put that together, it seems like the vehicle should weigh, I think you and I had estimated in the past, they might drop 500 pounds when it's, but that's when it's fully optimized and they're not fully optimized. So when the 4680, like there's probably gonna be a next generation 4680 in six months to a year that will have higher energy density. And there will be a new optimization of the structural pack and the castings. And that's when they may shave a lot more weight off. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think that's exactly the direction they're headed. Because as we've seen with recent rumors and what we've seen in their images is the battery cell I tore down is generation one. But as they showed us at Austin, there is a swirl in the new battery cell at the yeah. bottom rather than like a plug. And um, that should allow for better use of space within the cell and to increase the energy density by making the jelly roll a little bit longer. And it may also allow them to optimize how they're using the space in the pack. And on top of that, I mean, as you've seen with the Monroe teardown, they had one hell of a time tearing down that pack because yeah. it, it was built like a, can I cuss on here? Yes. So it was built like a brick shit house that battery pack in there were just, yeah. um, I think they overbuilt, severely overbuilt that battery pack. And that's how it works. It's like if you're building furniture for uh, furniture, the first time you build furniture, you dramatically overbuild it, use about twice as many screws and cross braces as you need. Uh, and then over time you realize, oh, actually I can probably cut back on some of that. And you learn and you uh, streamline and uh, trim out the fat. If they have enough cells to make 2170 model Ys, without needing 4680s for Model Y, and they can work on, you know, they got engineers somewhere working on optimizing the structural pack and working, and they'll come out with a next generation cell in the future. What they're really waiting for is ramping uh, 4680 cell production in Texas, Fremont, and eventually Berlin. I don't think they're producing in Berlin yet. What have you heard, or the, what's the latest you've heard about 4680 cell production in Fremont and in Texas? I don't think they're started in Berlin yet, right? Uh, correct. Uh, I think they're still, at least from the last drone footage I saw a few weeks ago, they were still completing the building. Right. So that's that's a, a full year behind schedule because originally they said they were going to build in Berlin first, and yeah. then they moved it uh, to Austin. Uh, now, in the original like approval documents, I forget what you call them, but it's, the Tesla submitted, they were supposed to be finished with that factory and have the equipment installed in Berlin, I think in just like December of last year. So they slowed that way down. They shifted their focus to Austin. And there could be a number of reasons for that. But in terms of like how much installed capacity that they have currently, at least based on what they've said in the past earnings calls, 10 gigawatt hours at Cato Road, which is enough for you know well over 100,000 vehicles when they get that ramped. And then in Texas, 100 gigawatt hours. And I believe they have that equipment installed now. And they're going to install 100 gigawatt hours in Berlin, hopefully by the end of this year. So that's, uh, you know, well and over a million vehicles of a year worth of capacity installed right now, and potentially uh, 2 million vehicles a year worth of capacity by, uh, you know, late this year, maybe early next year. Right. If, 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 if it's an 80 kilowatt hour pack, I think 100 gigawatt hours is 1.1 or 1.2 million vehicles. And the 4680 Model Y that 
came out of Austin was less than an 80 kilowatt hour pack. It might've been a 69. I think there were estimates it was a 69 kilowatt hour pack. Now, if they improve energy density, it'll be higher. It'll hold more maybe, but that might get you to 1.2 or even 1.3 or 1.4 million out of hundred gigawatt hours. So there's a lot of potential for high, but then you've got, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, this, this is triggering a lot for me because there's, well, there's pack size has a big impact on the number of vehicles. Like for Tesla Semi, that is just going to be, it's just going to soak up all the 4680 battery cells that can throw at it, depending on what the initial production is. Now for a robo taxi, you might only need like a 45, 50 kilowatt hour battery pack. So yeah. you, you'd be looking at, you know, double that number of vehicles, but sorry, I was I interrupted you. No, no. Uh, I, well, the thing about robo taxi is when they pitched it on battery day, they said it was going to use lithium iron phosphate. So that shouldn't use 4680 cells, but of course they're flexible and they can change their mind. <laughs> exactly. They can just shift those battery cells to where uh, yeah. the most optimal use case for them. And, and, and we should I, be, we, should, we, we limited the 4680s. Don't forget that Panasonic is building at least two 4680 cell factories and LG Chem is building a 4680 cell factory. And for all we know, there's more coming. Oh yeah. Well, the conversation around cell supply is an entirely, that's a whole conversation which we can get into. But one thing that is probably worth noting that I should have brought up at the beginning of the video was that can other manufacturers do what Tesla is doing with regards to being that adaptable with uh, different battery packs? I think any manufacturer can do it. Any auto OEM can do it. However, I don't think they're going to be able to do it as fast and with as much certainty as Tesla can do it because Tesla has been you know, making their own battery packs for well over a decade now. They have all this experience, all this in-house knowledge. So I think they can qualify these battery packs and integrate them into the vehicles much more quickly than anybody else can. Just like we saw with the entire chips thing last year. I think we can see Tesla do the same thing with battery cells. In fact, um, I think, was it Hornsdale? The Hornsdale, uh, when they built that uh, massive- The mega pack array. Yeah. Matapack, uh, mega pack down in Australia, they actually use Samsung battery cells for that. They sent out a call to Samsung because they didn't have enough Panasonic cells. And it was like, well, they either had to uh, get it done on time or- <laughs> uh, Or they had to do it for free or something. Yeah, give it to them for free. So it's just like, okay, let's mad scramble for battery cells. So they instantly sourced some 2170s from Samsung. And uh, yeah, that's just the way Tesla operates. So. I think other companies can do it, but I think Tesla's probably the best at it. I want to talk about 4680 and Panasonic and LG Chem making 4680s. But before we get to that, what you just said triggered something in me, which is when Tesla goes to somebody and says, hey, we need a lot of cells. I think if I'm not mistaken, Tesla might be the largest consumer of batteries in the world by a lot. Mm. Yeah, I think they're, well, they're using about hundred gigawatt hours and it depends. I, there's different numbers on the amount of cell supply that we currently have because there's different tiers. There's automotive grade battery cells. I think the total battery cell production right now is maybe 600 gigawatt hours. But if you look at like what's automotive grade and what's actually going into vehicles, it's more like four or 500 gigawatt hours. Don't quote me on that, but it just gives you a feel for the fact that Tesla is, oh, you know, somewhere between 15 and 25% of global lithium ion battery supply. They're soaking it up. So yeah. they're, the, they're the 800 pound gorilla. Well, that's kind of my point is when Tesla comes to you and says, hey, we want batteries, you're going to be more likely to jump for Tesla than you are for some small startup or some OEM that's just getting going, some you know legacy automaker that's just getting going. And like Tesla says, hey, we need 10 gigawatt hours of battery cells. And somebody else says, hey, we need 500 megawatt hours of battery cells. You know, Tesla's call is a lot more powerful because if you do a good job for Tesla, they're going to have more demand in the future. Well, it's an interesting optimization problem because you have that side of it, but they also don't want to be captured by Tesla and be completely beholden to Tesla. So they have to go, all right, how can we craft our strategy so that we can supply a lot of battery cells to Tesla and work with a really solid manufacturer, uh, but also be somewhat distributed? But they have to be careful about who they partner with because a lot of these companies might go out of business. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna push back against what you just said. Okay. Because it, I was about to bring something up and you just touched right on it. Mm -hmm. Panasonic and LG Chem are building 4680 cell factories. There's only one customer. Nobody else makes a product that can use a 4680 cell. No mm -hmm. one else has one on the drawing board. 
no, no one has even started to think about using 4680 cells. So Panasonic and LG Chem are investing billions of dollars. This is like the, the whole Moody's not giving Tesla investment grade credit rating. Like all you have to do is you have to look at LG Chem and Panasonic making this decision to invest billions of dollars to build factories, to build battery cells that only have one customer, Tesla. No one else. I mean, have you heard of anyone else making any plans to use 4680 in a product? Anyone of, at scale, not like, you know, boutique, like, not like Warren's Podcar uh, project. Um, no, it's, uh, I think I've heard of somebody working on a 4690, but it's like basically inspired by Tesla. And it's, um, yeah, but it, it's a, basically Tesla set a new kind of standard and now everybody's following suit. And it tells you, it's kind of like the Pied Piper. Uh, <laughs> Tesla, Tesla yeah. sets the tone and, it, and everybody's following. But it, but it seems like there's no other automaker. You know, GM's is standardizing an Ultium. Volkswagen has its plans for whatever they're making in Europe. I don't, I'm assuming that Hyundai and Kia are using battery cells from Samsung or LG Chem because they're Korean. Um, I don't, I haven't seen anybody even talking about using 4680 in another EV and you're not going to use it in a phone. It's not going to fit in a phone. So what else would use a 4680? Well, I guess what I'm thinking here is the, the 4680 pr production, that's, uh, I don't see any other company that that could be going to. And a lot of these other companies that are producing 4680 battery cells, I think it's going to Tesla. And there's a lot. Everybody's making their own version of the 4680 battery cell. However, one factory making 4680s is, isn't the sum total. Those companies operate globally. So they're going to have you know, 2170 factories and other countries making battery cells for other people. So I think... Uh, you know, they're going to devote the output of those factories to Tesla, but they're still going to be developing factories in other parts of the world, still maintaining some diversity. Right. Panasonic, uh, it feels like Tesla pretty much has them. <laughs> <laughs> they're locked up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and, you know, I think that's a happy thing for Panasonic. This is kind of one of the points that I think people don't, that, that I'm going to go with one of my, I don't know if this is a controversial opinion. Tesla builds battery cells now with the 4680. But they're only doing it because they want to make sure they have enough cells to make vehicles. And, and my theory about battery cells is it's not, it can be a decent margin business, but it's not as high a margin business as making Tesla cars, as selling, you know, robo taxis or Tesla bots. You know, Tesla sees a world where they're going to make products that are very, very high margin. And battery cells in the long run won't be that high margin. And they're happy to help these other battery makers scale production of battery cells and make a decent margin by battery cell maker standards if it means Tesla gets an adequate supply of cells so they can make higher margin products. It's not that Tesla wants to be in the battery cell business, it's that they have to be. Yeah, yeah, and that's, um, that's the message that Tesla has been sending for a while now is, and that, that was one of the key messages for, for a battery day for me, because I didn't think Tesla would go that far upstream up to the supply chain, like, um, you know, building their own cathode factory, et cetera. So the message Tesla is sending is we will do whatever we have to, to maintain growing at 50, 50% per year. Yeah. Um, so, and, but with that said, that, that requires other uh, battery cell makers like LG, Panasonic, et cetera. So Tesla's going to do what they can to support them. But one thing that, uh, jumped into my mind, and this is, has to do with your conversation with Bradford. My understanding is that the, the Panasonic factory, if they get credits for those battery cells, that $35 credit, and I don't know if this is correct or not, but I think this is, uh, Bradford did a, a little Twitter space on it, but Tesla might get the $35 per kilowatt hour credit for those Panasonic batteries. Well, is there any motivation for Tesla or Panasonic to continue scaling at that factory if they can make their own separate factory and get that $35 credit themselves? Right. Well, the 4680 factory they're building in Kansas, and maybe they're building another one in Oklahoma, they're not going to be governed by the same agreement, mm. most likely, because the ones that are being built in Giga Nevada are in Tesla's building. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that they're probably still incentivized to, to scale somewhat, it's just not as incentivized. <laughs> and it may be that Tesla makes an agreement with them. Hey, we'll share some of the credit with you because we want you to continue growing your 2170 and 1865 cell production. That's certainly possible that Tesla will just make a deal with them and give them a piece of it, even if they don't have to. I, that's my take is that 
Tesla is so motivated to get sales that they don't need to hammer the best price out of somebody. They really want to hammer the most production out of somebody. That's, uh, I 100% agree. And this is something that it's kind of shifted in the past year where it was all about cost, cost, cost for the past, uh, well, since uh, they started using lithium ion batteries in vehicles. But what's changed is now that, uh, uh, you know, the music is sort of stopping or slowing, there's, uh, the focus has become, all right, we need as many battery cells as possible, especially now that Tesla is so profitable with their vehicles. It's like, all right, our priority is actually growing as, as quickly as possible here. And we're, they might be willing to pay more of a premium, especially now that so many other players are getting into the game and the suppliers can probably demand a bit more out of those battery cells. I wanted to come back to this point about the tax credits and the flexibility. With the United States adopting this somewhat bizarre tax credit system for battery cells and battery modules and a few other things that are going on, plus the battery, the tax credits for vehicles, you create this sort of complicated structure of, and, and another car maker might only have one factory where they're making EVs, but Tesla has factories in China the US and Europe, uh, car factories, and apparently another one coming. And so Tesla essentially has, and they have bat battery factories as well in two continents, and they might, for all we know, build a 4680 cell factory in China. It gives Tesla the ability to decide where to produce cells and route cells to take advantage of tax credits or tax breaks that might vary country to country. So that flexibility plays into addressing even regulatory and tax issues. Does that, am I, am I, I feel like I'm getting too complicated there, but I think that actually makes sense. No, that's definitely a factor. Um, for instance, now I, I don't know how this is all gonna play out, but I'm just giving, giving a, a feel for um, one of the you know, variables that might factor in here. The battery cells of Tesla imports from other countries, I think they have at least a 10% tariff on them. And uh, if, if you can remove that tariff and also you get like a $35 credit, um, that might influence where Tesla builds their factories. Uh, now, in terms of how they shuffle around their battery supply, I think it might have more, yeah, this, is, this isn't something I've thought much about, but one thing I'm thinking about is uh, the raw materials, where they get those from. And uh, which materials feed which factories to uh, feed? Yeah, which, exactly. What they might do is they might quarantine and sort of isolate and ring fence certain batches of materials to go to certain factories, so certain vehicles can take advantage of those tax credits. Right. The batteries they make, the batteries that are made in China, don't have to use, or or the ones that are made in Germany don't need to use battery materials from a particular country. But the way the tax credit is structured, you'd want your Chilean. Or, or Canadian materials to go to the US factories. And then the other thought would be lithium iron phosphate is such a big factor in Tesla's long-term plans. I don't think Tesla was planning to build a lithium iron phosphate battery cell factory, but now it might make sense to because the tax credit is so huge and the cost of lithium iron phosphate is relatively lower than the nickel based cells. And it's easier to get the battery materials for lithium iron phosphate. So do you think there's a prospect for Tesla to start building lithium iron phosphate? And Elon has mentioned adding manganese to the mix with lithium iron phosphate. Do you think it's possible that Tesla's planning to build their own lithium iron phosphate cells? It's something that I've speculated on. I think they definitely will do lithium iron phosphate cells in the future. In fact, they might completely skip plain Jane lithium iron phosphate and go to uh, lithium, iron, manganese, phosphate chemistry. I do know that uh, from memory, Maxwell Technologies, who they bought this dry battery electrode technology from, I think they were playing around with that about 10 years ago. And um, I, I think it was a few weeks ago on Twitter, you brought up like, all right, what is this uh, LFMP or what is this uh, MP3 battery that CATL is developing? And I said, it's most likely uh, an LFMP chemistry that also is probably doped with a couple other things to add stability. But there is another option that I found when I was looking into the history of Maxwell, et cetera. One thing you can do is you can actually take uh, a lithium iron phosphate uh, cathode crystals, and you can mix it with some high nickel cathode crystals, and you can have kind of like a hybrid cathode. 
So I don't know how feasible that is, but I need to look more into that and eventually do a video on it because <laughs> there's a lot of options there for Tesla. That sounds uh, like a video. That sounds like a video I'm gonna have to watch twice. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. So you have LFP, you have LFMP, and then you might have some sort of hybrid cathode system. But I don't know how that would work and what the positives or negatives are. Okay, that's a lot to digest. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. There's 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 kind of a Cambrian explosion right now of all these different battery chemistries, all these different form factors, and I think it's going to be uh, because Tesla can adapt they'll be able to use all of these. But eventually, you know, 10 years down the road, I see it starting to become streamlined. We're going to start picking some winners, some uh, certain form factors and certain chemistries that are like the standby to allow Tesla to streamline um, their production process. And so they don't have to swap out different packs. I wanted to ask you about something more technical for a second. I get a lot of comments or questions from people who think that lithium iron phosphate cells will be made in a 4680 cell format. And my impression, I thought Drew Baglino was asked about that at one point, and he said no, that the 4680 cell format is optimized for nickel-based cells, but it's and not that it's impossible to make a lithium iron phosphate cell in that format, but it's not optimal for that chemistry. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the way he phrased it was, uh, it could have gone either way for me because I think he said, we'll choose the form factor that optimizes uh, the physics of that specific chemistry. Now, I'd have to read the context of that earnings call again, but they were talking about a few different things at once. So they could have been talking about internal 4680 battery cells that could have been talking about external supply. And that was when Elon said, uh, no, we don't use, um, what was it? Yeah, he said something, there's, there's a certain chemistry, a sor certain form factor that they don't use. And people confuse that comment as well. So it, it was kind of a jumbled conversation. But when I looked at it, what I found ultimately is that you can use an LFP form factor, an LFP, or you can use an LFP chemistry with the 4680 form factor. It will have enough energy density to provide well over 250 miles of range. It also offers some benefits. Uh, when you use a larger prismatic form factor for LFP, it has a negative, it may have a negative impact on cycle life and performance because uh, it's hard to, more hard to control the thermal when you're dealing with a massive prismatic battery cell. Whereas the 4680, it's smaller. Uh, you can control the thermals better, get better performance, and also um, potentially better cycle life. However, uh, you wouldn't get as much energy density out of the battery pack. Uh, and you wouldn't get as much range out of the vehicle. So I think if Tesla waits a couple of years, waits for their in-house LFP chemistry to mature, they should be able to get 300 miles of range out of an LFP chemistry with a 4680. Okay. Um, now, another thing to take in mind is there's no reason why Tesla couldn't do a prismatic LFP battery. Uh, but they've invested so much in the 4680 form factor that there's no reason not to use that form factor, but they can, if they think it's optimal to use prismatic, they can't switch. So they're not locked in. And there's been some talk about patents on the lithium iron phosphate technology expiring. Do you think that matters for LFP production in the United States in the near future? Now that it's expired, I, I don't think it matters anymore because there's, there's the base patents that deal with the underlying technology. And unless you had access to those patents, or you know, paid a licensing fee, you couldn't produce LFP battery cells because it was very, uh, first principles is the best word I can think of. It's just the basic chemistry itself. Now those patents have expired. So you know, people can start exploring more in the LFP space. Now there are other patents in the LFP space, um, uh, you know, developments, developments that have happened with the LFP chemistry, improvements, improvements to how they manufacture those LFP battery cells. So there are patents that you still have to navigate, but it's more open now. And you see more people playing in the LFP space, like a company called Mitrichem. Uh, they, they're planning on producing LFP cathode material in the US and increasing the energy density. I'm throwing a lot at you here. Yeah, you have. I'm, I'm going to have to watch my own video. I'm going to have to watch this video two or three times myself just to make sure I get it. Mm -hmm. And I'm kicking myself thinking, um, oh, let me ask you this question. A lot of people are, I have a Plaid Model X, which uses 1865 cells. And my, I have friends who have Plaid Model S's. Um, 
and you know, people think of the 1865 cell as this old technology, and yet we're driving the fastest cars on the planet with 1865 cells. Um, a lot of people are waiting for a 4680 Plaid Model S. They, they think that the Plaid Plus that was dropped was going to be a 4680 Model S. Do you think Tesla will eventually use 4680 in the Model S and X? What do you see as the future for that? With any with batteries, there's always a trade-off decision. Now, you with the, the Plaid Model S and X, you're dealing with a high margin vehicle. So you don't need to worry as much about production costs. So they can uh, uh, piss around with welding like 7,000 of those battery cells into that battery pack and uh, uh, still make a, a good profit on it. Now, so it's it takes more manufacturing resources to use that 18650. It's more costly to use that 18650. But there is a benefit of the 18650, which is it's such a small cylindrical cell that it's quite easy to thermally regulate that cell. And you can get a heck of a lot of performance out of that thing because you can pump so much cooling through it, et cetera. And that's exactly what you see. Now, the 4680, uh, I don't know how that would perform compared to the 18650. Because when they designed the 4680 battery cell, their goal from what they showed at battery day seemed to be, all right, let's make the thermal performance as good as the 2170 battery cell. But the 18650 should have better thermal performance than the 2170. So I think, well, another thing to take into account is that the 18650 might have performance that's actually in excess of the needs of applied model S and X. So right. there's, there's, there's really no way to know how it would perform if you popped a 4680 into it, because you'd have to look at it from the cell chemistry on up to how you design the pack. But I don't see any reason uh, why they couldn't produce a Plaid Model S or X with a 4680 battery cell that has, you know, a little bit better performance, better range, et cetera. Because as they've said in the past, they get plenty of power out of these battery cells. They even said in the past that, you know, they could do a Tesla semi with the 2170s if, if they wanted. So right. it's just a matter of, it comes back to the whole point of this discussion, which is, all right, uh, there's battery cells available to Tesla. They're going to use those battery cells where they're needed most. All right. Well, I guess I guess my theory about why they dropped the Plaid Plus was they they're making the 1865 cells, and there's no other product that they make that will use them. I mean, they could put them in Powerwall or Mega Pack, but if they already have a great product, the Plaid Model S is already the fastest car on the planet. My Plaid Model X is maybe the third fastest car on the planet because there's some seven hundred fifty thousand dollar Ferrari that's faster. Um, if if they started using 4680s in Model S and X, number one, they'd have to re-engineer the cars. And that would take a lot of engineering resources that they don't wanna put into, was it, although S and X are profitable, they're low volume. So they're not really the future of the company. The future of the company is the Model Y and the Robo Taxi. So it doesn't make sense to devote engineering resources to re-engineer Model S and X for what's gonna be a low volume vehicle. Well, they wouldn't necessarily have to, well, 46, if they were going to do structural pack in particular, they'd have to re-engineer, they'd have to do front and rear castings in a different size for S and X. Um, mm -hmm. they, they probably wouldn't use 4680 without a structural pack. So well, the, just the engineering resources to redesign that vehicle, you know, if it's going to sell a hundred thousand vehicles a year, is it worth the effort? Overall, I'm in agreement with you. To me, it, uh, they have those 18650 battery cells. They got that working for the vehicle and it's the amount of cell supply that they have is about 10 gigawatt hours from Japan, roughly. And that's enough for a little over a uh, hundred thousand plaid or a hundred thousand model S's and model X's. So everything's perfectly aligned there. No sense in messing with it. Now, what to say is they could make uh, a battery pack using 4680 battery cells. But if you're going to do that, if you're going to go out of your way, devote the engineering time and resources to making a special 4680 battery pack for the Model S and X, you may as well go all the way and do the giga castings, et cetera. But once again, you, like, as you were saying, it comes back to that scale issue where um, why, investing all, why invest all that time, energy, resources into getting giga casting machines for those vehicles? Because 
they would probably each require their own separate gigacasting dies and machines because they're two separate vehicles. And you're looking at like 50,000 castings for, for each of them. So it's, yeah, as you said, it doesn't seem to be worth the time and engineering resources. The only reason why I think they might do that in the future, if they did, is to get the most out of the Fremont factory. Because they've said in the past they want to increase the production capacity sure. of the factory to like, you know, 700, 800,000 vehicles. Uh, they could strip out some of the Model S and X lines, put in some giga castings, and uh, even j just with the Model 3, freeing up all that body shop, turning it into vehicle production, they might be able to uh, squeeze more out of that factory. Does it, does it surprise you that we haven't seen any indication of any more Model 3 production anywhere in the world? There's no plans to scale model, to build Model 3 in Berlin, say, or Model 3 in Texas that we know of. Yeah, it does surprise me to us. Uh, one thing I'm thinking of, well, sorry, that I'm thinking in real time here on this, I'm trying to decide what my point of view is on it. Uh, one of the, I think one of the biggest use cases for the Model 3 is like what we saw with Hertz. I see all these companies around the world uh, that rent vehicles, and the Model 3 might be a perfect vehicle for that. But we have to wait and see Tesla's if they do produce a $25,000 vehicle and make it available for the public, and it's not a robo-taxi, if we have a robo-taxi and then we have a $25,000 vehicle, then uh, it, it might be better to in, invest those battery cells into those vehicles rather than more Model 3 lines. In the meantime, the, the Model Y is, in, is more in demand, has a much bigger market, so they may as well uh, build factories for the Model Y. Yeah, I just thought, you know, if they went ahead and did castings for Model 3 and they did a refresh basically of Model 3, because they could probably, I, I have a, just to be, I have a Model 3, uh, 2018 Model 3, and I have my Model X Plaid. And I could almost see the argument for like a refresh 3. You know, they did a refresh S. If they did a refresh 3 and they saved some weight and they did castings and they might dramatically lower the manufacturing cost of the 3, because it probably cost them less to make a Model Y than it cost them to make a Model 3 at this point because the manufacturing is so much more efficient. Yeah, uh, I think it's, at one point Elon said that, that it's the, the cost to produce a Model Y is very near the cost of a Model 3. And here it is, I think it's a, a year or two later now. Well, at least, how long ago did the Model Y come out? Was That was at least two years ago, wasn't it? I want to say it was 2019, but maybe it was 2020. Yeah. So it came it out earlier than expected. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know when it makes the most sense for Tesla to shift over the Model 3 lines to a stamped casting process. Yeah. That would take a lot of time, energy that they could invest in building new factories. So I think the only re once again, I think what would drive that is maximizing the space and maximizing the utility of Fremont and squeezing okay. as many vehicles per square foot out as they can. Okay, I want to ask you one more sort of semi-technical question about, I think, everyone's favorite topic with Tesla, which is Cybertruck. I think that's everyone's favorite over RoboTaxi, but we'll see. Yeah. So now that I drive a Model X Plaid, which I think is in some ways comparable to what Cybertruck is going to be, and I know my Model X Plaid with 104 kilowatt hour pack has 333 miles of range officially. And it doesn't really have 330. If you drive it the way you want to drive a Plaid, it doesn't have anywhere near 330 miles of range. <laughs> um, it turns out that high speed driving affects your range. I look at the Model X and I look at the Cybertruck. And if I'm not mistaken, the Cybertruck's frontal, I'm thinking about aerodynamics now. I think the Cybertruck's frontal surface area is greater and the coefficient of drag is higher. So aerodynamically, the Cybertruck is going to be significantly worse than the Model X. And it, it, in theory, the Model X is going to have 500 miles of range. So by my math, the Cybertruck to get 500 miles of range is going to have to have at least 180 kilowatt hour pack. Do you have any sense in your head of what the size of the pack would be for a Cybertruck in order to achieve that? Yeah, there's, there's actually a, a channel. I forget the name of the channel. But he, he did some um, analysis. Uh, he looked at the, the, you know, the fatness of the tires, the coefficient of drag, all of that. And he came to a minimum, uh, depending on the tires, 
He said if you had like low rolling resistance tires, you'd need at least 180 kilowatt hour battery pack. If you had tires that had higher rolling resistance, you'd be looking at more like 200 kilowatt hours for yeah. the, the maximum range Cybertruck. Yeah, just what, like when I do my own, when I drive my, my X and the same thing with my three, I kind of do mental math in my head and I sort of mentally math out in my X two and a half miles a kilowatt hour. With my three, it's like four miles. The, the X plat is, it's not surprising for one of the fastest cars on the planet. It's not super efficient by, by EV standards. Although probably compared to like the Taycan or some other EVs, it probably is efficient. But I roughly get two and a half miles a kilowatt hour versus four plus for my Model 3. So I would think the Cybertruck is going to be closer to two miles a kilowatt hour. And if it's two miles a kilowatt hour, you might even need, a, that's that's real world driving, not theoretical 55 mile an hour driving. So when we talk about 500 miles of range, we're really talking about going 55 miles an hour on a day with no wind on flat ground, right? And then, yeah, I probably get more than three miles a kilowatt hour there, but at three, let's suppose the Cybertruck could manage three miles a kilowatt hour. That would be like 167 uh, kilowatt hour pack to get to 500 miles of range. That's, that's my mental math, my napkin math. Well, I'm, I'm going to be interested to see uh, how much this Cybertruck is going to weigh. Yeah. And not only how much it's going to weigh, because, you know, I did some analysis. I did a whole video on how much it might weigh. And uh, it looks like they could, you know, get it comparable to the weight of an, uh, like a gasoline, uh, a loaded gasoline powered F-150 or maybe a little bit less. But we'll see. But I think one of the, for me, the most interesting part of the Cybertruck is at the last earnings call, they said, well, these packs that we're producing now, the current structural pack, our giga castings, et cetera, we maybe give them a B or a C rating and right, right. how optimized they are. But with the Cybertruck, you're more looking like an A architecture with the giga castings and the structural battery pack. These things were designed to go together. They weren't just like the 4680 structural pack was kind of shoehorned into the Model Y, and it also has to be able to adapt to the 2170 pack. So it's just not fully optimized so that you have those manufacturing optimizations. And they also teased in recent earnings calls that uh, they aren't stopping at the giga castings and structural pack, et cetera. They have plans for other things. And I wanna know what those other things are. And there's two things that are on my mind, and I could be totally off the wall here, but it's uh, using, I think it's Brembo Sensify brake system where you don't need to run brake lines anymore. You just put an electronically controlled okay. braking system at each corner. So you'd strip out the master cylinder, you strip out all the brake lines, et cetera. And then the other thing is the uh, electrical wiring. There's a number of ways that they can reduce the wiring in the Cybertruck uh, from data over wire to increasing the voltage of the architecture. A lot of people are saying it's not likely because the entire supply chain is built around like a 12 volt architecture, but right. you know, Tesla's hitting a scale now, like I said, they're the 800 pound gorilla in the room where you know, they're getting to two, three million vehicles a year and they're getting the economies of scale that, that either A, they can manufacture it in house or possibly get the industry to turn a leaf. One thing that makes me believe that's more of a possibility is there's a few, few weeks ago, sorry, I'm going off on a side note here. Yeah. Elon, a few weeks ago, he recommended a book called What We Owe the Future. And one thing that that book notes, and I've, I'm only like maybe a chapter or two in, but what it says is any improvement that you make today, you aren't just improving the things that happen today, you're improving all the things that will ever occur in the future. So if they switch everything to a 48 volt architecture, it's not just like saving a few bucks on the vehicles today, saving a few pounds of weight. What they're doing, they would move the entire industry to a 48 volt architecture. And over time, uh, you're looking at huge amounts of savings in terms of uh, wasted materials, uh, CO2 emissions, uh, efficiency, et cetera. So even if it's only a slight improvement in terms of their manufacturing process, it might be worthwhile because it would have a cumulative effect, especially when they're hitting 20 million vehicles a year. And especially if they get the in industry to completely, you know, move to a 48 volt architecture, which is helpful when you're dealing with vehicles that are purely electric, that are more electricity intensive rather than belts and pulleys. I think you've overloaded my brain. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to ask you and I'm, I'm, I'm drawing blanks. 
So I want to thank you for coming on the channel. I want to, again, ask the audience, please support Jordan on Patreon. There's a benefit. You get early access to his videos, and it's worth seeing what he has to say in his videos early. I, I watch everyone, and, and I'm addicted to Jordan's videos. Uh, and of course, please support me on Patreon. There's links to that in the description below as well. Check out my t-shirts at elonbits.com. Do you sell t-shirts? Uh, yeah, there's t-shirts on the, uh, like on the YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, check out my other videos. Of course, check out Jordan's channel links below, uh, and, and subscribe to both our channels if you don't already. Thank you everyone for watching.